Yeah. We're still on there Zoom. Lessons. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'll edit that part out. Welcome, everyone, to Climate Chat. I'm your host, Dan Miller. Today, we have a very special guest on a special day, uh, climate scientist Kevin Anderson. And uh, we interviewed Kevin nearly three years ago. And uh, this is going to be another very interesting discussion. That that interview was one of the most highly watched climate chat interviews that we have done. And I'm sure this one's actually going to get more people because now we're on YouTube instead of Clubhouse. And uh, uh, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. Kevin, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, like last time, I'd like you to start out giving us uh, just a brief introduction on your background, your education, and how you came to being a climate scientist. Oh, crikey. Okay. Um, I've not been asked that for a while. Um, so I see myself as an engineer. I trained as an engineer. Um, I left school at 16 and worked in the engine rooms of ships doing my apprenticeship, uh, sailing around the sea on, on tankers and container ships and so forth. So I trained as an engineer and then later went to university and did an engineering degree. Um, and then I went to work in the oil industry. So I was a design engineer for um, offshore oil platforms in the North Sea. So I worked both onshore and offshore. I'd always had an interest in the environmental issues going right back to being a child. Um, but they were just environmental issues then. It wasn't climate change. It wasn't a big, well, it wasn't something that people discussed in isolation at all. And that that interest in environmental issues Although this may strain, sound strange to some people, that, that thread was there when I was working on the ships and when I was working on the oil platforms. So I was involved in various things outside my normal work job to do with releases of CFCs, the pollution incidents that were, were or were not recorded from our oil platforms. So it had always been quite a deep interest. And then whilst I was offshore, climate change became a big issue. So I went back to university to, to do a master's, then a PhD, and then I've been working now as an academic um, on climate change for far too long. Um, okay. probably, well, well, since, since the early nineties, really, so far too long. And uh, as I mentioned when I first interviewed you, I heard about you and read about you in like 2010, and uh, there was you wrote something called "Going Beyond Dangerous," which was the name of our first interview there, and that really shocked me. I um, mean, I would have been studying climate for at least 10 years by that time. And still, the way that you told it very directly was uh, actually scary, but I think it energized me. And uh, I also know that when people heard that last interview, they were also shocked because, I mean, I had gotten used to it, I guess, <laughs> over that time frame of knowing what you're saying and, and internalizing it. So I, there's a little hmm. bit of a warning here for people that aren't really up on how far gone climate change is uh, in our discussion today. So that was, I'll just say that. But one of the things we spoke about, and one of the things you you study is carbon budgets. And you talk a lot about carbon budgets. And in our last interview, almost three years ago, we talked about how much carbon budget is remaining to hit 1.5 and to hit two degrees. Since that time, I mean, last year in 2023, by some groups like Berkeley Earth say we have already crossed 1.5, you know, for a year, not not necessarily the trend. So what can you tell us about carbon budgets? And do you agree with uh, Jim Hansen, who in his last paper said that we have hit 1.5 degrees for all practical purposes? Right. Well, there's a lot in there. Um, and firstly, Jim, Jim may well be right on this we may well have hit it for all practical purposes scientists are awkward awkward devils we, you know, we hit it for one year and that doesn't tell us we've hit it or we haven't hit it so we we typically want to see a longer running average so we typically use a, an 11 year running average so a single year doesn't tell us we've hit it or we haven't hit it but it but it may well be that we're already in that long um, that, that, that long run average. We might be already one of those years. That means we're not going to drop below 1.5. But obviously, we're all we all know this is a slightly well, we're going through a slightly unusual not an unusual period, but um, you know, El Nino period, which does mean that we see slightly higher temperatures than we would do if it wasn't for for that happening. So it could be that we drop below it again. But the trend line, let's be absolutely clear, the trend line is not that we're going to hold temperatures stable. Our temp trend line is very clear that the temperatures are just going to keep rising and keep rising 
for the very simple reason that we keep dumping huge ton huge tonnages of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And until we actually cease doing that, not reduce it, but cease it, the temperature will just continue to rise. And so, you know, Jim is completely reasonable saying for all practical purposes, we, we appear to be at 1.5 and, and the temperature is going up above that. Now, the other, if you like, the slightly more conservative side of the science that you come out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, will say that we have a certain carbon budget left for um, being certainly at 1.5, with, well, with, with certain probabilities, a 50-50 chance have we hit 1.5, and, and there's a little bit left, but we're talking about very just a few years. So even the IPCC, which is, I think it would be fair to say, is a, has a very sort of conservative framing of, of where the science is. Mm -hmm. Even those budgets for a, 50, a flip of a coin chance of staying not not going above one point five in any sort of permanent sense, they will still only have just a handful of years, six seven years, and some more recent assessments of the carbon budgets. Because remember, the IPCC are always a few years out of date with the papers they're using. A paper produced just last October in Nature said we have, we have about four or five years for a flip of a coin chance of 1.5. But even for two degrees centigrade, we've only got about 15 years of current emissions. Well, I've got to ask so, you about that. What's your... So we're heading, on? We're heading towards... Yeah, yeah. We're, heading, we're heading towards two degrees centigrade. Um, the emissions are not coming down. The emissions are continuing. And remember, and I think it's absolutely key, bringing emissions down does not mean you reduce the rise in temperature. Only when you cease emitting do you reduce the temperature? So you have to stop all emissions. Well, actually, I understand. And, and you, that, don't I think, even re you don't reduce the temperature. You just, if you're lucky, it stops going up because there's still warming in the pipeline canceled by ocean CO2 uptake and those yeah, cancel out. And yes, methane and yeah. aerosols cancel out, right? Yeah. And there's, again, there are different views on this, all of which are scientific, well, all the good ones are scientifically legitimate. There are different interpretations about what that might be. Some people think the temperature will keep going up for quite a lot longer. Um, the consensus in the IPCC is probably, again, slightly more conservative, said that you will, you'll probably get, a, if you if you ceased all emissions now, as we are today, then you would probably get a couple of decades of, of, of additional warming. That warming would slow down, then we'd stop warming, then we'd start to cool down. Other people say, well, actually, we've kicked in so many feedbacks already that we'd likely see ongoing warming for quite some time. Certainly, let's be clear about this. Even if we ceased all emissions today, and um, there's no suggestion that that's a purely theoretical experiment, but if we stop them right now, many of the impacts would continue to get worse. The like impacts we put in rise. place. Well, sea level rise is one, but some of the uh, destruction we've, that we're already um causing some ecosystems, they will that destruction will continue. And it's not in isolation because climate change is just one of a whole suite of um, ecological challenges that we face. And there are a lot of them are, are um, uh, you know, interactive. And so although we tend to all tend to silo our expertise into particular areas, climate change or something else like water or whatever it might be, actually these things all play out together. So even if we stopped emissions, many of those impacts would continue. But of course, we are not, there's no sign that we're going to stop emissions in the in the near future at the moment no, no sign of that at all we're at so, record we're at record emissions right now aren't we i mean we're at record emissions every year we're at record emissions i mean we break the record every year because every year we delude ourselves that next year will be better and i think that's what, an important point there is that we're never solving yesterday's problem because yesterday's problem was yesterday's problem and it's changed you know people say well how do we resp respond to paris paris was 2015 that was over a third of a trillion tons of carbon dioxide ago a third of a trillion tons. The problem we face in 2024 is not the problem we faced in 2015, which is not the problem we faced in 2010 or 2000. Every year we fail, the problem gets harder next year. And so when we often talk about progress, that we've progressed, technology's got better, some things improved. It hasn't improved. It just hasn't gone backwards as fast as it otherwise might have done. All we are doing every year at the moment is going backwards, not going forwards. There is no progress on climate change but the steps backward are perhaps a little shallower than they otherwise would have been. And that, I think, gives us a better mindset to think about what we're doing. We are failing at a slightly lower level than we otherwise would be. That's right. I, I think that is such a key point that doesn't get discussed. And that's, that's what one reason, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today. And we named this talk today, 
climate change choosing to fail. That that's what we're doing. It's a choice. We don't have to fail, but so far we've chosen to fail. We're going to get into some of the reasons, you know, beyond the science. I did want to stick yeah. to, the, to the science. You we, you talked a little bit about one point five and two degrees. One of the things that the IPCC and the COP meetings talk about are getting to net zero by 2050. And, and you've been very critical of net zero. I think, I don't know if you called it a scam, but uh, what, why yeah. is net zero problematic and what should we be um, striving for instead? Hmm. I think it's turned out to be a scam in how it's been used. You might argue it had some scientific legitimacy originally. But let's, if you go back to the previous set of IPCC reports, you know, assessment report five, net zero wasn't mentioned in there at all, you know, and not in the way we use it today. In, in the UK, the Committee on Climate Change, in its fifth budget report, it, it didn't mention it once. In its sixth budget report, it's there, uh, there several thousand times. <laughs> and so it's almost every page. And so let's be clear, net zero is not a phrase that we've, we've been using for a long time. It's a phrase that has come up almost overnight. And the media use it, the academics use it, the funding agency uses it. So everyone there, every company uses it. Everyone talks about net zero. And overnight, we've, we've adopted that language as if it's always been there. It hasn't. So at a purely scientific level, all we're talking about with net zero is balancing inputs and outputs into the atmosphere of greenhouse gases. But that's not what we're doing when we're talking about it in our, in our normal day-to-day -day speech. What we're talking about there are all sorts of scams and ruses that we're using to avoid making the difficult decisions today. And you know, we can think about this. It's, it's, it's a, an accountancy scam. It allows us to do all sorts of things. It allows us to exchange between different greenhouse gases. So we can start to substitute. And, and this is a real, I mean, substitution is a real accountancy, accountant's dream, if you like, a bean counter's dream. You can say, I'll swap a few molecules of CO2 for a molecule of methane. Well, these are very different in terms of how long they last in the atmosphere, their chemistry in the atmosphere, the levels of certainty involved with them. You then say, well, we'll think about the carbon dioxide from a car journey today versus animal husbandry pro, uh, uh, projects in 2030 that might affect methane emissions. Well, now you're passing it over time between a guaranteed emission from a car or a plane today and possible changes from methane emissions in pigs in 2030. And then you think, well, well, maybe we'll plant some trees and we'll talk about carbon dioxide absorption in 2035 versus some industry emitting today. So we, we then substitute between greenhouse gases that, that have very different chemistries, very different times in the atmosphere, very different levels of certainty. And then we pass it across time as well. And so this allows us to do all sorts of scams in our spreadsheets to make it look like we're doing quite well, whether that's a company, an institution, even, even an individual, and certainly for countries. Um, and then... The, Another scam on top of that, I think sort of like if the, the cherry on top of the scam cake, is are these things called negative emission technologies that sound that they exist, that, oh, we can just, well, let's just use negative emissions. So, so it, we say it now, and it doesn't sound odd to us anymore because we've used that language for so long, you know, for the last three, four, five, six years, if not a little bit longer now, that almost like, well, of course, we can just use negative emissions, but there are no negative emission technologies out there at scale. There are a few pilot schemes that, and they just they just capture a few thousand tons here and a few thousand tons there whilst we're putting about 40 billion tons of green of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year. And so they're another scam in the spreadsheet. So rather than have to do something early in the spreadsheet in the year 2024, 2025, 2026, you can say, oh, no, we'll apply some negative emissions in 2035 or 2040. That means we don't have to make those difficult changes today. So at every level, you can you can scam this net zero. And this is why you find... BP, Shell, Exxon, Saudi Aramco, they've all got net zero targets. Uh, mm -hmm. The UK, Canada, the US, the Saudis, they've got net zero targets. We all have net zero targets, yet we're all seeking more fossil fuels. Right, right. So we're all, we're all in net zero. Everyone's bought into net zero. Surprisingly, the emissions keep going up and the temperature keeps going up. So somewhere in it, the physics has said, we can see through that scam. But the rest of us, we love it because it deludes us and it allows us to avoid those deeply political, difficult questions we do not want to have to ask, or at worst, we don't want to have to answer them. So you had a lot of things in there um, that I want to cover. Um, but but one, just very briefly, in our last discussion, you said the phrase 
plant, or you said you said this in the past, plant trees for good tree reasons, but don't plant yes. them for carbon reasons. Do you s still agree with that statement? Absolutely. That you uh, yeah. And in fact, there's a paper out recently saying that some of the estimates of carbon absorption are not really as people thought before. Yeah, let's. we know why, we, we, why we've got climate change. It's because we keep dumping carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of other ecological challenges out there, biodiversity and lots of other ones. So let's deal with those, you know, like let, let's plant trees for good tree reasons, for biodiversity reasons, for a whole suite of other wonderful reasons about why our planet has historically had huge coverage of trees. Lots of good reasons. Let's not plant it so some bean counter sat in an office somewhere can make a government feel better about itself or a company. You know, that that's a scam. So don't count the planting of trees. But that's not to say don't plant them. Yes, let's plant them. Let's plant them for good reasons. And of mm. course, the problem is as soon as you move them towards a counting framework, all you then say is, well, what are the best trees that allow us to absorb carbon? Well, actually, they may not be the best trees that allow us to help uh, support biodiversity so there's a whole set of other reasons and once you move once you reduce this thing this this, this wonder of trees and of forests down to this it's just carbon you <laughs> lose all those myriad benefits that are there and you of course hide the real reason it is carbon it's burning fossil fuels that is absolutely the key reason we've uh, the, why we have climate change and that's the thing we have to stop and forestry and all of these other things are just deluding ourselves that we need to remove ourselves from fossil fuels almost overnight now. Okay. Well, we're, we'll get back to negative emission technologies a little bit later, because I do want to bring that up. But I still want to stick a little bit on the sort of latest science side of things and, and how that impacts carbon budgets. So as you know, Jim Hansen and his team, Leon Simons, who we, I had Jim on and Leon on, and a uh, very important paper, Global Warming in the Pipeline, which I'm sure yes. you've seen. And he took uh, the IPCC to task saying that, hey, the, your uh, Earth climate sensitivity or equilibrium climate sensitivity is wrong. It's not three degrees that you're using sort of as your average in your models, but it's 4.8. And they said that's based on new information about ice age temperatures. We know that since it was 100 parts per million less in the ice age, if it was actually colder in the ice age, that means an increase in parts per million are going to have a larger increase in temperature and, and other other things, other ways that they figured that out. So how does that, uh, and they also realized that aerosol cooling from coal plants and ships and things like that is also much more than what the IPCC assumes. To me, if it the warming is a lot higher and the cooling is a lot higher, um, that means the carbon budgets we all been assuming are wrong. And what, what's your thoughts on that paper and how that impacts the remaining carbon budgets? My thoughts are that Jim could well be right. Jim and his colleagues could well be right here. The science, as we all know, the science is fairly complex in these sets of issues. And so there are different interpretations of the data. Um, let's imagine that this, all the scientists work on this are well-informed and are honest. Mm -hmm they still can come to different conclusions. And so the recent paper, Lambol and so forth, had much smaller carbon budgets for 1.5 degrees centigrade, about 40% smaller for a for 50-50 chance of 1.5, about 20% smaller for um, an 83% chance of staying below 2 degrees centigrade. But then you've got Jim and others on the other side of it are saying actually the budgets are even smaller than that, if not already being you know, eliminated. We've used them all up for some of these temperatures anyway. And I think both of those assessments are valid assessments. Now, which one will turn out to be correct, we'll only find out in hindsight. But mm -hmm. if I was thinking about what do we have to do about this, I would think we should be guided much more by Jim Hansen's start end of the spectrum, if you like, than the more optimistic end. So if at one end you've got, say, Miles Allen, highly optimistic in one end, and you've got Jim more pessimistic at the other, if you're saying which of those, and let's imagine they're both equally valid, and they're, but they've just chosen different assessments and assumptions, and 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 but that's because there is some uncertainty there. So they're just choosing different bits and pieces in there. But all of that can be valid. If from a policy perspective, you think, well, where, what should we be guided by? Well, you'd be guided by Jim's view because we surely, given the dire consequences, you must be taking a precautionary perspective. But given where we are, I don't think Jim's assessment makes any difference to what it is we need to do. We're doing nothing anyway. 
We need to do everything we can possibly imagine to do, even if you took the even if you took the optimistic interpretation, if you took the IPCC assessment, that would tell you, given the consequences, do everything you can possibly do and a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so in fact, this work doesn't tell us to do any more than that. We're doing nothing anyway. And the standard science just tells us we need to do everything. So from a policy perspective, we can all have these interesting discussions. But really, we know what we need to do. And it doesn't matter where you go on the spectrum. The, the response, the, the, the uh, mitigation response about in terms of what we have to do about emissions is the same story. Do it immediately, as deep and as fast as you can. Pull every lever you've got. Um, but within, I would say, within a, a wider ecological and social sort of set of considerations as well, because you don't want to exacerbate something else really serious whilst trying to solve one problem. So I think so, what you were just saying as an analogy is that you're about to put your children on an airplane and, and out walks two uh, airplane mechanics. Uh, 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 mechanic Hansen says, uh, by the way, the oil seals are all screwed up on the engine. It's going to crash. You, you know, you can't fly. And yeah. a mechanic uh, man <laughs> says, oh, no, it's all fine. It's all fine. It, it, everything's there's no problem. Are you going to put your children on that airplane? Of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, we would never I even mean, think about it. And that's the situation. No, already. yeah, but I actually think it's slightly different. I almost think that actually, the, if if you use that plane analogy, if you push it quite hard, the engine's yeah, going to crash too, just a little later. Yeah, the optimistic ones come out and say, "Oh, those engines are really dodgy. I wouldn't go anywhere near those engines." And then Jim comes out, forget the engines; the wings aren't there either. <laughs> um, and so you know, and so no one is saying get on the plane. Everyone says, "Don't get on the plane." Right. And we're so we're that's, that's where we're at. But we're still getting on the plane. Yeah. We have all our children on the, uh, by the way, the plane and planet just add a T to plane and you got planet. So I think that's uh, some, there's some interesting things going on there. So, okay. So let's kind of tie a little of this together. You just said we have to do everything like and more. Okay. Yeah. So far, the focus has been on emissions reduction, which we're not doing. Okay, we're not. And, yeah, and you mentioned focus has not been on it. What? I would disagree. The, the focus has not been on emissions reduction, and we must not use that language. We have not focused on it at all. What we've focused on is doing nothing, delaying things, anything we can do to avoid emission reduction. That's what we've done. No, so no, I, no I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking the question the right way. Folks like you <laughs> and uh, Michael Mann and the IPCC say, "Oh, we have to reduce our emission." Then there's this other group saying, "By the way, we also need." negative emissions technology and solar radiation management. But I, but my question is, if we aggressively, we, we listen to you and we aggressively go after emissions reduction and, and be as optimistic, uh, you know, but realistic, not, not just theoretical, um, can that keep us under two degrees, let's say, if we actually started a in a realistic way, not in, you know, just crazy tomorrow, everything stops. Uh, yeah. Are we there or do we actually still need, even if we, we shouldn't use them as an excuse, uh, uh, solar, as Jim Hansen says, we need solar radiation management. And um, uh, and he also thinks we need carbon dioxide removal. They think that's a, a expensive right now. Yeah. Well, um, what do you think? I think for two degrees centigrade, if the IPCC budgets are correct, and I think there's a massive caveat on them, I mean, they're, they're likely to be much larger than we actually have left. But I think- Wait, wait, say that again. Two degrees, the budgets are- the, 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 the budgets are much smaller than the IPCC suggests. Sorry if I got that wrong. So, so I think they're, they're saying we've, we've got more scope left than we really have. Mm -hmm. But if the IPCC are right, I think you can just about stay below two degrees centigrade. But when you say realistic, I think that's an interesting term. If we think the options out there that we're coming up with are realistic, then they're not going to work. We have to stretch what we determine to be realistic. Hmm. And I think that's really important here. We're not talking about the normal things we might be thinking about. We're talking about going much further than that. And so there are a whole host of things that in the mitigation debate, the discussion about reducing emissions, we simply will not touch you know, things like fairness and equity. Um, these things are just beyond the pale. We, we, we mustn't touch those at all. So we, though, though those have to come in. When, so at the moment, it's unrealistic to discuss those issues. They have to become center stage. 
if we're going to solve this. So for many people, that simply is unrealistic. Their political views won't hold the view that you can discuss equity and fairness. And they're central to the maths of staying below two degrees centigrade. You're even saying in the that, IP um, things like wealthy countries continuing to burn at a high rate versus allowing uh, developing countries to use more fossil fuels? Is that what you mean by... Yeah, well, hopefully we'll come... Yeah, hopefully we'll come back to this later. But to me, one of the core elements that we simply will not touch is equity between countries and within countries, both of those. Mm -hmm. And the scientific community has deliberately not touched those as well. And I think the maths tell us we have to ask those questions. And everyone else tells us it's politically unrealistic. Well, the physics doesn't give a damn about our um, ephemeral politics. It only cares about CO2 molecules. And if we're serious about staying, even with the IPCC budgets, then that unrealistic debate around equity and fairness has to come into it. So I'm just saying I question what you mean by realistic there. I think we have to be we have to open up that, that envelope of what is realistic to be much wider than we're prepared to think about. But even then, I think that so just about if the IPCC budgets are an accurate reflection of where, what the real science is, then maybe we can just stay below two. But I think it's highly likely that they are going to be optimistic. If that's the case, then we have to try other things as well. Well, actually, now we don't know. Uh, I'm going to well, while we're on this. Um, Han uh, Hansen says two degrees is catastrophic. Like we're, we're, we have this target that we say, hey, let's stay below this. Hey, hey, the world's doing a great job. We're on target, even though we're not. But but two degrees is like hell on earth. I mean, I, I don't. Is what's your, what's your thoughts on yeah. two degrees of warming? Yeah, I mean, it, it does appear that the more we look at the impacts, then the more it appears that that the you know the impacts occur at lower temperatures if you like so the more and more work we've done on the impacts the more we start to realize these temperature differences really matter and i think it's tempting for people to say well everyone said it would be hell on earth at 1.5 degrees centigrade but it isn't well firstly as i said before it takes a while for that te for the temperature for the heat we put into the planet to play out its effects but we're already seeing those in some parts of the world already and for some people it is hell on earth so I think it's very easy for those of us who are wealthy in the, in the if you like, the geographically insulated parts in the global north to say, well, it's not such a problem. Other people elsewhere really struggle. And it's, we're only just touching these temperatures and they're only just, the heat is only just playing through the system anyway. Um, but I think Jim and, and many others are right when they talk about going towards two degrees centigrade now looks you know, incredibly damaging. And when you think historically, we, don't, we have no... You know, in very long periods of time, we've never been where we are today, a million or more years, so way before humans were here. Um, and so we are working, we're, we're, we're heading, we're, we're racing towards completely unknown territory. And that seems incredibly dangerous, given that we know that life evolves. I mean, life, life isn't static. The, you know, life, human life and ecological life is remarkably good at evolving with changing circumstances, but not when it occurs overnight. And that's what we're doing now. What the changes we're talking about in just a generation or two. They, these are overnight changes. They're, they're, from any reasonable sense, from a system point of view, they're instantaneous. And that's what we're doing. And, and so our last interview, so that, we were talking about whether we could stay under 1.5 and three years later, or less three years later, we at least hit it at least one time. And uh... yeah, yeah. And we might be now, we may well be that we, maybe we don't drop below 1.5 again. Maybe that's, that will be the case. Um well, Hansen said we might get to 1.4, but he said if the bottom is 1.4 and the top is, we're at 1.8 right now, I think for February, you know, or something. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty yeah, amazing. I mean, the temperatures not, the temperatures won't come down. I mean, there might, there might be a bit of noise in the system, but the temperatures won't come down until we eliminate um, fossil fuels. And even then, there'll be, as you said before, there'll be, if you're optimistic, there'll be a lag of a decade or two, and if you're pessimistic, then it, the temperature rise could go on for quite a lot longer. But uh, g given that no so we have to do everything and more, and that we also just had the discussion that you better at least believe Jim, or at least act as Jim is right, and therefore the budgets aren't really there. That means that emissions reduction alone won't keep us safe at this point. And therefore, the things you derided before, like carbon dioxide removal, which I agree, by the way, if it's used as an excuse for not reducing your emissions, well, then it's it's kind of silly. But it that but that also means if you believe that, it means that we're not taking climate change action seriously, which of course we are not right now, as you we're not, no. point out. But in the future, is is there a future where we will take climate action seriously and therefore have 
the entire range of tools available to us to fight it. There's no evidence at the moment that we're ever going to take climate change seriously. That, I mean, the evidence at the moment would suggest to me that we're, it looks like we're a genetic cul-de-sac, that we'll be a little blip in the fossil record. Now, whether that turns out to be the case, I don't know. But I mean, I, just, I think if you stood back and objectively looked at us, you say, well, you know, we haven't been here for very long. Um, and we're just, we just got out of hand quite quickly as a species. And you know, we'll be that little, whoop, there we were, that was us. <laughs> we looked quite destructive. That how about when the time. shit hit and, really hits the fan? I mean, that's that's what my field. By the way, you you and I both have been like calling for climate action for a very very long time, and I haven't seen anything until recently. The reason that I think that the increase in attention, not not action, but increase in attention on climate change, is purely because of climate damage that's been recognized as climate damage, and perhaps as it gets worse and worse, maybe that will be. A tipping point for for serious climate action i mean that's my hope uh, what, what do you think yeah well if we're relying on the climate coming back and slapping us so we eventually act then we yeah maybe that will be the case i would rather we i think we should put we should push ahead of that i mean remember the climate is coming back and killing people already yeah so right. it is killing people it's not killing enough of the high emitters it's not killing our children but it's killing poor people's children typically people of color a long way away and we, we've never cared about them and we continue not to care about them and we embed that complete disregard and colonialism in our models as well our so-called objective models hmm. um on, on what we should do about climate change and they're deeply colonial models and that feed into the ipcc so yes we we need to be considering some of these other options which is really what you're alluding to here we have to consider those other options as well and and uh, you know, you know, derided previously. I mean, I mean, I went back and checked recently um, for something else I was asked about. For years, I've been saying the same thing. You know, let's let's research and deploy other these these technologies, CDR and so forth, provided they fit within ecological and sustainability criteria. Let's do that, but let's reduce emissions, assuming they will not work at scale. And that's been my view for a long time. Mm -hmm. But what we have done instead is not really pursue the research on this, but ask the bean counters or told the bean counters, assume it will work at scale in every single model run you run. Mm. Every one of them. And ensure it works. Just put it in there that every single one in the hundreds of runs you produce, it will run at a scale which is just completely unprecedented almost overnight. And that's what we've done with them so far. Mm -hmm. And they can justify that by spending a bit of money here and there and a little bit of research. We can get you know, a, a few entrepreneurs to say, we've, you know, we've, we've stored a couple of million, a couple of thousand tons of, of it here. And all of that is wonderful. The BBC presenters will go out and interview them and they'll all, they'll all pat each other on the back. It'll all sound wonderful. And the bean counters stuff it in the model, in every single model. And we come out with a nonsense when Jim Ski stands up at the IPC, at the, at the COP and supports the the oil executive chair of the COP and says, yeah, we can have 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we still have 45% of current gas use and about, what if it was, 35% of current oil use. Utter nonsense. The <laughs> chair of the IPCC stands up and says that because we have stuffed the models to the gunnels with assumptions about negative emissions. And we can, and that whole nice narrative is there now that we can all, the whole expert community can almost pretend that we're doing something about climate change. You mm -hmm. pull out that scale and it demonstrates we are doing nothing. The carbon budgets tell us a completely different story. And Jim may be right, maybe there's almost no carbon budget left. But even the standard carbon budgets tell us a completely different story to the narrative we get from Jim Ski, the head of the IPCC now, that previously head of Working Group 3, which is on, on mitigation on what we should do about climate change, which is basically... as I mean, with some exceptions, I see working group three is basically Exxon in practice. Um, they're not they're not really doing what we need to do about climate change. They're locking in delay. Mm -hmm. And negative emissions have been hugely central to that. And we as an academic community have not have not been honest to ourselves and to others about this. Uh, even the people that are doing the research on it, we have allowed that delusion to occur and continue, and we don't speak out. And so for so at the moment. Those, those other technologies are deeply part of the problem, not part of the solution. That's not to say that, that they could become part of the solution. Mm -hmm. But those of us engaged in this debate have not stood up to be countered when they've been misused repeatedly by the great and good of the climate realm.
And so until we do that, then we cannot say that they're part of the solution. We, are, we and they are part of the problem until we are prepared to stand up and be counted for their misuse in our models. Right. And Jim, uh, you might know, Jim Hansen was going to give like talk at COP28 and it was disinvited because his research is you know, contradictory to the IPCC and, and all of the happy talk that you're talking about. Can you talk a little bit more about the fact that the head of the last COP and the head of the next COP, I believe, are both fossil fuel executives? Yeah. Is that yeah. something that when you started out your climate career, you thought would have been a possibility that the head of the climate conference would be a fossil fuel executive? To me, it's like if you wrote that yeah. story, no one would believe you. It no, would they, would, be, they wouldn't have been. It would be too ridiculous. Yeah. And come on, take that out. Yeah. That's, that's too yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And what's what's most disturbing is that we will go out to defend them at every you know. So as soon as one of them says something utterly stupid, like we said at the last COP, you know, the head of the IPCC comes out to defend them and says something equally stupid, and no one speaks out and says, hang on, Jim, that's nonsense, and you know it is. So mm -hmm. and that yeah, so we're all party to that, either through our support of it or through staying silent. So you know, so it, also the IPCC can, can the IPCC even even theoretically it's like theoretic do something to address climate because it's not set up it's set up for consensus so if Saudi Arabia doesn't want a particular policy it's, that's not going to get in there and the UAE or anybody else so is it even a body that we should be yes it's the only thing we have now I guess but is it something we should be relying on to fight climate change? I think it's really important, the IPCC. About th I think we have to recognise it's not just one thing. Um, firstly, that has different working groups. So the working group one on science, I think it does a pretty good job um, on the science. Working group two on adaptation and um, impacts, I think it does a pretty good job on that. And some of the things it said have been pretty stark. Working group three is just Exxon in disguise. Um, you know, there are good people in working group three, but working group three and the integrated assessment models, good people work. Some of the people are good people there are working in deeply subjective boundaries that have been set up by we mustn't rock the political boat. That's the broad framing of working group three and has been for a very long time. And Jim Ski came from working group three and now he's now he's bringing that. That what? What to me is a deep delusion of working group three to the whole IPCC framing. Hmm. But I wouldn't get rid of work. I wouldn't get rid, rid of the IPCC. I, don't, I, I for a long time said I don't think working group three should be part of the IPCC. It's just in that, reducing emissions is innately political and it hides that almost like we've, we've done these objective assessments in all of these integrated assessment models. Yeah, all of which are in the global north, handfuls of these models that always produce the same results by the same sorts of people using the same sort of modeling practices with the same underlying assumptions, basically. They'll all tell you they're a bit different, but they're, they're just tweaking um, a, a general equilibrium model, which has sort of growth at its, its core, can't ask fundamental questions about society. Mm. These, and I don't think they can be remedied. I don't think you can solve them. I don't think there's a way to make them better. You know, every time you add something else to them, I think it just hides how, how they're just, um, the way they're structured, the way they're framed is deeply part of the problem. And so working group three to me, at least the majority of working group three, which has been dominated by the integrated assessment models, these big models that are basically economic models with a bit of technology or a bit of mythical technology and a bit of um, social sciences bolted on the side and a, and a small climate model, but basically just economic models, the business as usual models. These models have dominated what we have to do about climate change. But I don't think we should tar the whole of the IPCC with that brush. I think there's some very good work on in working group one and working group two. But working group three, I think, has been deeply problematic for a very long time. And that's not to say there aren't some very good people in there. There are some excellent people in working group three that have been pushing very hard. The integrated assessment models have, have got the whole of working group three. I'm trying to think of it. I was about to use a, an inappropriate phrase there. Um, but they've, they've, they've got it in, in a headlock. Um, and, and, and so whatever comes out from its summary for policymakers it's always what have the integrated assessment model has said it's not what a lot of the other wonderful people and other good work that's gone on there that's somewhere in the in the footnote um the, the, you know the, the main storyline which is which i think has fed into the ongoing delay and delusion has come out of the integrated assessment models from working group three and now 
the head of that group is the head of the IPCC. And I think he is very much in line with like the chair of this year's COP and no doubt will be with the, in line with the chair of next next year's COP. And so I think we're in a really difficult situation now because that delusion- From a science point of view, got- I think from a science point of view, they do good science, but from setting global policy to save us, that it's not really in a position to do that. I mean, it's not doing anything. It's saying- I mean, it's coming it up was general words. I mean, uh, Paris was supposed to be on the right track, but it, it yeah. was very, you know, there's only a, a tiny portion of what needs to be done. And of course, we're not even following up with that, right? Or our meeting no, but targets. I think, I think we're spending too much of the IPCC. The IPCC doesn't set policy. So the IPCC just is there to inform policymakers and others who set the right. policy. Um, the problem is, the IPCC Working Group 3 is there to say, here's a set of policy suites you may want to consider. Here's, here's another set of policy suites, but it doesn't do that. It says, here's a set of policy suites that will help, help you delay action on climate change. It's done that for years. Um, and that, that has been its principal remit. So it has fed into the, into the dialogue of delay. So Exxon, BP, Shell, and all the other oil majors and the, and the fossil fuel industries, they, de- they delayed action by undermining the science for years. Eventually, the science gets broadly accepted by all but a few strange people. and But the delay has continued now because now Working Group 3 does Exxon's and the fossil fuel companies for them by delaying action, by stuffing their models full of all sorts of spurious pseudo tech to mean we don't have to do things by, well, but now, by the, literally within a few years. I mean, what really matters now is what we actually do between now and 2030. That's the time frame of action, not the time frame yeah. to bring about action. The time frame in which to act. And do you, do you think if we took out all of the that technology and just laid it bare that okay, that, look, that's not going to be available. Here's the real numbers. Do you think that would actually change anything? <laughs> it would make it look a lot worse, and we would we would oh my god, yeah. we're, we're screwed. But yeah. you think actually it would all of a sudden we would be reducing emissions faster than we were? No, um, well. I'm sure we do it faster than we're doing. Whether we're doing it fast enough, I don't know. Because the problem is, we have had this process of delusion for 20 or 30 years. So it is deeply locked into us culturally now that we can solve the problems with technology. Mm -hmm. Not real technology, pseudo-technology, and some real technologies, but they won't be delivered in time. And so um, now that's been the the sort of ruse that we've played for a long time. If suddenly we swap to change our mind on that, that would... I don't think overnight that would bring about a change in the store, a change in the rate of uh, reducing emissions. But I think it would be much harder if we started to hold our policymakers to account. You signed up to deliver on this. And if the experts at every every single occasion turned up to say, hang on, that airport expansion, that road expansion, those new big houses you're building without solar panels that are not not passive house and have a gas heating in them. If every single time the experts said that isn't in line with your commitments, that isn't in line with your commitments. So it no occasion would the policymaker at a council level, at the national level or an international level get away with it because the experts told them every time it's not right. Then I think that would start to change the dialogue and it would feed into civil society much more. Instead, what we've had is civil society has broadly taken the, the standard science and said, you need to do a lot more. And the expert community has said, oh, don't you worry, we'll find some fluffy way with some mythical technology to solve it for you, or we've stayed quiet. So it's civil society, some people in civil society, that have been much more honest to the science than the scientific community has been itself. I mean, Mm -hmm. I find that really disturbing. The scientific community has done the science and then has not told a narrative that aligns with the science that we have done. We've relied upon gaggles of civil, civil society to actually do that for us. Mm-hmm. And we've just played a nice storyline for a whole suite of reasons. We like the prestige of being with the policymakers. We like the being invited to all the big meetings of the CEO, meeting the CEOs of companies. We like all of that prestige element of it. We, we are incredibly high emitters by and large. We like that. We think that we're worth it. I mean, we expect to have these large salaries. I mean, we're not... It sounds almost too trite to say this, but I think it is important. I've never said this on live before, but three very senior people who have a huge amount of time for in the climate realm. One of them won a major prize and spent a large money of the amount of the major prize on a very powerful sports car, fossil fuel sports car. Another one, <laughs> a cli- very wait, a senior climate one, prize. I thought, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, climate prize. Climate Another one. Climate prize. <laughs> I, I, I don't I'm say too much. I don't want to be right, anyway. Do do yes, but yes, a climate. You want a prize in battle sports car. A climate prize spent a large amount of money on a large, powerful sports car. Another very senior one bought a second home. Another one used to take additional flights to maintain his premier, his his or hers premier and um, privileged flight uh, loyalty card. <laughs> this just illustrates the li the life that the senior people who frame the debate on climate change in the scientific community, what we have normalized. Mm. And this is why I think if we started to act differently as institutions and as individuals, what we know from the psych psychology research repeatedly is that people, there's greater credibility to our arguments. So yeah. although our arguments don't change, the credibility that's aligned to our arguments does change. And, and so I want to point out moment, to those who don't know that you haven't taken an airline flight in how many years has it been? About 20 years now. 20, 20 years. years. And even when you went to China, a very interesting story, you went to China, you took the train and it took you, what, a couple of weeks to get there or something? like that. 11 days there, 11 days back. But it's possible. I mean, that, I'm not saying that everyone should be doing that. But I think it is important for those of us who are embedded deeply in climate change to demonstrate that it is not about just tweaking business as usual. It's about doing things significantly differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, that's not in the models. The models don't allow that these integrated mm. assessment models about what we need to do. They're not about doing things differently. It's about doing things the way we do them today with a bit of greenwash tweaking to it. And until we actually are honest about that, that will not work. And we've been dishonest for so long that it, it, it made, it's made it harder and harder. Then I think we won't solve climate change. So I do think we will have to, those of us, the expert community, will have to start to um, demonstrate in our institutions and indeed in our lives to some degree that we think it's a serious issue. Until we think it's a serious issue, and demonstrate that i don't think people will really take our arguments quite so seriously hmm. um okay. and, and and i don't just mean just tweaking our you know, i'm not just making you know there, there's some big changes here so i talked to quite a few colleagues who do a lot of field work well why is it when colleagues do field work they feel they have to fly backwards and forwards to do their field work often say in the southern hemisphere let's imagine it's some work in the southern hemisphere so what you really what we're doing there is you get a rich white person fly to another country to do the field work. Can't the people there do the field work for us? Can we not find a way to train them so they can do the field work for us and we can pass the information without the huge carbon footprint attached to it, without the colonialism attached to it? Why do our journalists feel they've got to fly to other parts of the world with the camera crew to film some disaster that's elsewhere that's occurred elsewhere? Why can't those people be trained to use the cameras and report? You know, we've we've embedded this sort of colonial view of the world and this elite view of the world, and we like to think of ourselves as good people in this. And we're, there's something deeply problematic in all of this. And we have to start to unpick this if we're going to be serious about climate change. So in, even in the realm that I work, how we work as academics, how we do our research, there are some absolutely key changes we need to bring about. And we're not even doing that. We're not demonstrating we, we think climate change is seriously. Our universities aren't, aren't doing that. You know, none of our institutions are doing that. The conference merry-go-round of climate negotiations and, and academics flying around the world, that's not doing it. You know, none of us are doing this. It's a scam. This is going to be my one of my final questions for you. But while we're at it, um, what kind of things would if you if you're in charge, um, would you do? I mean, you mentioned one thing is that the scientists and the other people working the climate community can walk the walk more. But in terms of um, getting policies to change or, or these kinds of things? Do you have suggestions on how we can move the, I mean, not only the scientific community, but the rest of the world forward to, you know, people say they, they're concerned about climate. They don't vote on climate, uh, these kinds of things. They don't, you know, take that action. They're, they're, I mean, there are young people, by the way, and I'd love, love your thoughts on Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, and that kind of thing, where they are taking, you know, serious action to try to get the public to pay attention but what are your thoughts on what we should be doing yeah well this comes back to my point early on that we never open up the debate about equity and i'm not saying this regardless of our political position if we if we are serious about our paris commitments even the two degree c framing so let's imagine the 1.5 is no longer really viable but let's imagine the two degree c framing if we're serious about that then absolutely key to that from the maths is issue, uh, issues of fairness we are not all in this together. And the bit about the beginning, we are choosing to fail. That we is a very small we. 
Mm. And the real trick of us experts and us high emitters is to pretend we're in climate change together. We're all in it together. And that way you can say it's quite hard for us all, difficult, difficult changes. That's a lie. We're not all in this together. A few of us are responsible for most of the emissions, a relative few of us, still quite a big number, but relative to most people on the planet, still very small, and even in our own rich countries. Um, and a few of us are at the forefront of the impacts. So, and that's not us again. The high emitters, us, we're not at the forefront of the impacts. Other people are, low emitters elsewhere. And until we are prepared to acknowledge this issue of fairness and what that means in terms of the climate debate, I think we will, as I say, I think we will fail until we're prepared to do that. And there's no sense that we will at the moment. That, that means not even discussed. I mean, we're not really, we're only now we're starting to discuss, discuss this issue of fairness and equity. So mm -hmm. you, you look at the UK or the US, the reason I say this, this wee bit is important. The argument I started making a few years ago now is that for most people, responding seriously and appropriately to climate change is good for their, for their well-being, for their material well-being, for their health, for the health of their children, for their education, for their travel, for the, for the affordability of their homes. Almost every element of that is, is good, improved. So if you think about it, if we're serious about climate change, you've got to retrofit the existing homes. So that it, I think about the wealthy countries, the US and the UK, deeply unequal societies. You've got to retrofit our homes so that people's houses don't require energy to heat them or very little energy to heat them. You need to make sure that we've got where we can renewables on those properties if that's viable. All new properties built have to be to a high standard so they don't require any heating and have those renewables embedded. We need to have public transport so we move away from um, cars um, as, as being a main form of pr private moving people around. So move to public transport. We need to electrify our energy systems. Most energy systems are only about 20% electrical electricity most of it 80 percent of it 70 to 80 percent of it is typically just direct fossil fuel use we're gonna to have to electrify almost all of that that's a massive jobs agenda if you improve the public transport you improve the air quality where people are living if you improve the air quality that improves the the ability of the children in those areas which are usually poorer to improve their educational attainment so and that you know all of that is really positive for the majority in our society the problem is how do we pay for that we pay for that by moving the the labor and the resources that the relatively wealthy people like me have completely normalized in our life. So rather than doing the things for me privately in my house, they are, at least until we've solved this problem, they are there putting in the renewable power, putting in the electrical lines, retrofitting our houses, putting in the public transport, pu putting in the train lines, building the, the buses and the, the wind turbines, all of those things. But that's a huge shift in the labor from the private from furnishing the private luxuries of a few of us for the public good, not to give it to the poor or anything like that, but for the public good, to physically change our infrastructure. But we don't have that debate at all because we do not want to forgo our second homes or our, or our large properties or our big SUVs or our flying business class or our regular flights, all of the things that we've normalized, big double door refrigerators, completely a completely obscene consumption lives that we have normalized as if it is okay for 8 billion of people on the planet to aim to live like we do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And once we've solved the problem, once we've made this physical change to our infrastructure, we can go back to massive levels of inequality again if we want. But in the interim, unless we're prepared to move that labor and resources from what it's doing today, so it's like the Marshall Plan, the, the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. It's mm -hmm. going back to Roosevelt's fireside speeches. It's, it's that sort of scale of change that we require if we are to respond to climate change in any reasonable fashion. There is absolutely no sign we're going to do that. And the scientific community, the expert community has closed down at every occasion any opening up of that debate because it seemed to be too political. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it is political. Closing it down is political. Yeah. And I realize in the States, that's a big challenge in the States because you have even more problems in the States than your very polarized politics. I mean, it's bad enough in somewhere like the UK, but you know, the US is even worse for that. I think probably the EU is in a slightly better position. Maybe other parts of the world even more so, perhaps in mean, places like China, perhaps. I, I don't like to comment places that are so culturally moved from anything I know that I think I have to be careful about my sort of typical sort of colonial arrogance about other parts of the world. But certainly for the UK... For the EU and to some extent the US have some cultural similarities. I think there are, you know, we can see why we're not we, we are not opening up that agenda here. Um, I know well, we see that in the UK, the US, we still approve new fossil fuel infrastructure projects when that's 
not possible if you're taking climate seriously. I would I use the phrase it comes as a, as a surprise to many, but it turns out you can't reduce fossil fuel emissions by increasing them. And that seems no, to you can't, but... the, the UK and the US uh, policymakers think is possible somehow. Yeah, and that's the net zero scam. Of course, you can in net zero. You can do anything you want. Um, you can have as much fossil fuels as you want with net zero. But it's not just about the fossil fuel companies, is it? It's about selling the SUVs. I mean, why are the houses and the estates being built at over 150 square meters? You know, why is it we celebrate the excesses of, of certain people in our society, whether it's Taylor Swift or Gates or Musk? Why do we celebrate those excesses or so, the stars? I mean, we, don't, we never celebrate the people that really matter, the, the teachers, the police, the people who are doing you know, or, or making things in our industries. We don't celebrate them. We, we celebrate excess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we aim to, and that is a sign of success, you know, excess consumption whether it's resources or whether it's emissions that is a measure of success in our society until we are prepared to ask questions about those sorts of values which we're, we're simply not prepared to do that in the models which is why we stuff them full of negative emissions why mm -hmm. we stuff them full of pseudo tech where we put in lots of you know suv a sports utility vehicle evs you know all of these things we shove all those things in there which allow us to have a greenwashed business as usual and we all know that's going to fail. But, you know, we, what we don't want is the child to call out and say, the, you know, the emperor's naked. No, the emperor's right. been bloody naked for years. It's been obvious to all of us and we dare not call it out. And, and, and as, as I'm saying here, until the math states, until we're prepared to ask those difficult political questions about value and norms, we will fail on climate change. It is not a technology problem. Technology is, an, technology is a prerequisite of addressing climate change but it is insufficient. Right. Now, it may have been sufficient if we started in 1990 or 2000. In 2024, you cannot deliver the rates of change with technology alone. It requires now, because of our choice to fail, the ones of us who cause most of the problem, our choice to fail, it now requires such fundamental rethinking of almost every facet of modern society. And that's why I think we're much more likely to head towards being a genetic cul-de-sac, because there's no sign that we're prepared to do that, not in our cultures. Well, kind of speaking of that, most of the, when we talk about carbon budgets, we're talking about staying under a certain temperature, like one and a half, two degrees, and and we're thinking about those impacts. But parallel to all of that, we are realizing that uh, global warming is also causing tipping points. Uh, yesterday, I interviewed Dr. Rene Van Westen, who studies AMOC collapse, and I interviewed yeah. Dr. Diplitzen earlier about that, saying that AMOC could collapse, you know, well, Peter says in, you know, 20, 30 years. And, uh, and, and, and Renee yesterday said, if we're going to fight this, if we're going to try to stop the AMOC from collapsing, we probably need geoengineering starting like right away because, you know, once it starts, it's out of our hands, right? It's not like the temperature, which maybe will come down a little bit later uh, if, if we do things right. So given tipping points, layered on top of just the increased temperature, which of course causes tipping points. But but so far our carbon budget's focused on two degrees and things like that. Given yeah. that we might be near tipping points, um, that brings us into the discussion, uh, again, it, with Jim Hansen also brought up in his paper that maybe we have to start to try to take control of the earth energy imbalance, the way he puts it, which really means uh, what I like to call sunlight reflection methods, because it very clear and understandable what it means, but other people call solar radiation management, solar geoengineering. So I wanted to get your thoughts on whether that's something we should be researching, number one, and actually even considering deploying in the, I call it, you know, next 10 years, uh, some, some mm. time frame. Well, the simple answer is, is yes, but I think it's much more complicated than that. It's interesting, isn't it? We're prepared to talk about geoengineering. We're not prepared to talk about fairness and equity. <laughs> We're not prepared to talk about how we actually remove the resources from allowing us to have building. Instead of building aircraft, we build trams. Instead of building large houses, we build. You know, we're not allowed to discuss that. But geoengineering is fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that tells us almost everything we need to know about this debate. You're right. Not not just this one, but the debate in general. And so I find this fascinating. That uh, fascinating and deeply disturbing. That we will, you know, we started today's uh, event here with some issues with this technology. 
You know, we have huge issues with technologies on a day-to-day -day basis. We have not even found in our universities ways that lights can be switched off uh, in the evening when no one's there. We haven't even but we're going to find ways to geoengineer the planet. <laughs> um, it, uh, there's a certain hubris there I think we have to be cautious about. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to research these things. And I go back to what I said before, and I've said something very similar for lots of years. You know, let's do the research. Let's fund the research. But let's reduce our emissions, assuming that they will not work. So deploy them if they meet ecological and social sustainability criteria. So I don't have a problem with that sort of framing, but it is a different framing to reducing emissions. And so let's let's we should we should look at the other things, you know, as well. But we're not looking at what's serious about reducing emissions. We pretend we're looking at emissions. We said before we're looking at emissions. We're not looking at emissions. We're not prepared to ask those questions about technology and fairness and resource use and where we should put society's resources. We're not prepared to ask those questions, but we are prepared to ask questions about re reflecting sunlight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Doesn't that tell us something about where we've got to? That's tell us that we're, we're not serious about climate change. We're going to have chats about reflecting sunlight, but not have chats about how do we build public transport? Well, surely we'd be much better off putting at least more of effort into actually trying to do the public transport question. So I don't object to these other discussions but they are taking away from the fact is that we are not discussing anywhere about reducing emissions. Mm -hmm. Just a bit of, we'll have a few renewables, we'll have a bit of nuclear power, but these are all in addition to using fossil fuels. They're not moving away from fossil, fu fossil fuels in a timely fashion at all. Right. And I so we are because not, renewables are now generally cheaper than fossil fuels. They're growing exponentially. Everyone thinks that's great, but if you take a look at fossil fuels, it's kind of, it's not, to be fair, it's not going up a lot, you know, and uh, but it's it kind is of, going up. Though. I mean, well, in total, very slightly, I would say compared to before, yeah. right? But it's not dropping dramatically like it needs to. Do you well, see emissions are going um, renewables five, ten years from now being so cheap that they just blow fossil fuels away and actually start to replace them, not just supply our new energy demand like they're doing now? Yeah. No, I think there was some interesting. I think what's happened with renewables is really fascinating. And and it's a really, if you're look, looking for a, a good news story, of course, the public, the, the press love good news stories. If we're looking for a good news story, hey, look how cheap they are. But we're not locked into fossil fuels because of their, because how cheap they are. I mean, fossil fuels are incredibly expensive at numerous levels. If you had in the, all the health costs and all those other things that are there, um, you know, they are, and pollution issues. Most expensive well, form of energy you could ever imagine using is the way I put it. Yeah. But. but that's not why we use them. We, we use them because we're locked into them culturally because they because they feed into the existing power structures in our society you know the, who who runs the cops it's the fossil fuel organizations they run the cops now um, you know we all jump to their tune they fund the arts they fund the sport and they fund I, I do a lot of cycling look at the cycle races there are all numerous fossil fuel companies and countries petro states that fund that it's it's everywhere it's in every facet of our life we're not escaping it in any way at the moment you know, the climate does not care about renewables. The climate does not care about efficiency. It cares about CO2 molecules and greenhouse gas molecules. So we have to actively phase out the incumbents, rapidly phase them out. Not just and so substitution could could be a part of that, but in isolation it will not be because the, because they are a very different business model. How how renewables we probably want to get into that now, but you can make a lot of money from ongoing sales of the fuel, whether it's oil, gas, or coal. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you've got solar, you've got wind. There isn't really an ongoing fuel to sell. Um, okay. You know, you're not you're not having to produce something. It's the wind and it's the wind and it's the solar, and so it's a very different business model for making profits, and that means for maintaining power and power relationships and those norms are the thing again that we do not discuss in any of the models. And so I think I think we're, all of these things that we talk about are distractions in some respects from the sort of fundamental key elements of why have we not responded to this, what is effectively an existential challenge um, in, in almost every regard. Um, and I think we have to be very careful when we're talking about more technology, that we're not just feeding that debate or feeding, sorry, feeding that delusion that we can solve climate change now with, with bolt on bits of kit. It is, it's gone far too far for that. That's not to say they aren't part of the narrative, but at the moment, I think the narrative that, that they are part of is one of delusion, not one of action. Hmm. So, well, I have a million other questions for you, but I, I want to get to the audience and, and have them ask questions as well. But I'm going to end as sort of a general question. 
what do you think um, individuals uh, like those listening to this program or maybe groups of individuals, um, maybe some climate group or something, uh, what do you think um, they can do to move us closer to the choice to succeed as opposed to the choice mm -hmm. to fail? Uh, what what kind of things have you seen that excite you or do you envision might be helpful? Mm. Well, firstly, I wouldn't like to go outside a cultural realm that I'm familiar with. So I'm, you know, I'm, I wouldn't like to make a comment on the many countries that make up the continent of Africa or, or many parts of Asia, for instance. But I think I can comment on the UK to some extent and on the EU and to some extent, someone like the US, where there are some, and Australia and so forth, there are cultural similarities. So this is system change. We're talking about system change here. That's what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And system, the two sides of system change, and the, if you like, the, the personal part is not a separate part. So personal change, which we don't want to pursue, most of us, because we like, particularly those of us engaged in these issues, we're usually quite high emitters and so forth. We don't want to be, be, be driving change ourselves, but we have to do it ourselves. And that's partly because that allows, again, the credibility of our arguments to have greater, well, our arguments to have greater credibility with others. So demonstrate the change ourselves, try the things out ourselves, and that helps us think these things through. And then, but use that to help us engage in, 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 in larger scale realms. Now that could be in our school or our university. It could be in our local council. It could be our local policymakers. It could be the national policymakers. And so we have to have a, it's a political debate, this. We have to engage politically and bring up, I would argue, bring up the difficult things we're not being prepared so far to bring up. Um, and so we have a key role here because we cannot rely, as, it, as it's been demonstrated for 30 years, you cannot rely on the expert realm. The expert realm has has sold out on doing something about climate change. Mm. Now, it's not to say we couldn't be brought along to this, and certainly some of the earlier career researchers and experts, I think, are more prepared to speak out. But even mm. some of the highly regarded sort of great and good of the science realm, if you look at what they're saying, they're really just about modifying, however radical their science might sound, when you look at their solution space, it's all about you know, tweaking the business as usual, another bit of kit, another bit of technology. So mm -hmm. do not rely on the expert realm. Civil society is absolutely key to give scope for us to open up the scale of the, or the, the range of the narratives about what we must do about climate change. Now, that can be at multiple levels. Say so it can be local, it can be national, it could be international as well. But, when, but those narratives have been closed down by the expert realm for a very long time. And so it sounds trite, but it's not. I mean, I think we have to be able to open up those narratives. There's no clear answers to what we need to do, but what we have, but, but, but except for the fact is we must open that debate up to be much wider than let's just have a few EVs, a few bits of solar panels, some more renewables. You know, that is not going to deliver the rates of change that we need. Um, and so I think pub the public civil society is absolutely key. The policy realm is too weak and the expert realm has sold out. And mm. so only when we start to work together in this, and in the expert realm, I include the journalists. The journalists have been terrible, in my view, on mm. climate change. Not on the science, but on what we need to do about it. They've run scared again. The journalists have often run scared of their editors, and their editors have run scared of who owns newspapers because no one wants to open up the debate about fairness and equity again. So it sounds like I'm coming at this from a political perspective about fairness and equity. They simply come out of the maths, regardless of your political position. You cannot squeeze the emissions out of those that don't emit. <laughs> and the, given the time frame that we have and the and the and the infrastructure changes we require almost overnight now, you know, we have to we have to you know, I think say the Roosevelt and the Marshall Plan of Reconstruction of Europe, that's that's the scale, if not in bigger than that, that's the scale of the of the challenge that we face. Mm -hmm. Are we up to that? Well, at the moment, the expert realm and the policy realm certainly isn't. And if it's going to be, it Probably needs not, to yeah. be pushed by society. Well, not, it won't be in isolation. It, it, civil society has a massively important role here. And it, that is true throughout history. You know, major changes have never been driven by the, by the top down. They've been driven by pushing the system, by all sorts of people getting engaged in that debate, by vociferous people being involved, often doing things that are seen at that time to be inappropriate. You know, whether it's a suffragette movement, I mean, we we know the we know the history of where big changes have come about, and it's never come about through neat negotiation by people at the top. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I wouldn't take that as an optimistic view, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but but driving but what you are saying is and I agree with you that we do need to you know make our leaders lead by telling them what to do and uh, it hasn't happened yet not enough people are engaged but more and more will be and I think the shit will be hitting the van more and more for a broader group of people and hopefully is yeah. my my favorite so they, they, that will be something that will help us get more serious about this but. Yeah, but also just on this leadership, leadership occurs at every level. And we like to think of leaders always being the people up there, the head of our university, the head of our council, the my local politician, the prime minister. You know, they're leaders in some ways and not in others. They're mm -hmm. also deeply locked into the baggage around them. Mm -hmm. So those leaders need other leaders elsewhere. The leaders could, you know, when you think about climate change, who's been a leader? Who's driven the agenda on this? I mean, I don't know. Has, has, has Biden been more important than the 15-year-old Swedish schoolgirl? Which one's been more important on climate change? I mean they're not <laughs> leaders are not yeah I mean, anyway, people have different views towards these people but all i'm saying leadership isn't just about top down leadership is about as much bottom up and demonstrating change as it is by the by the great and good and it's that I mean, i've used this world this language a lot it's a messy partnership it's an emergent partnership between between groups in society between civil society and leaders whatever that might mean whether it's whether it's in our institutions or our policy makers directly um, it's, it's not neat. And in that, there may well be social tipping points where we could actually start to reconstruct a society that would help us address climate change and the other ecological challenges we face as well. And indeed, perhaps even some of the social challenges we face. I mean, we, we do have those as well. Wow. So I'm going to open it up to others. Uh, keep Please keep your questions, and uh, like just questions for Kevin. If you have a comment, the question and comment all together, 30 seconds. And uh, we're going to start with Stacy, our co-mod. And Stacy, welcome. What's your, what's your question for Kevin? Limiting to me to one is like almost impossible. But um, the the one one comment first is the the one point five and scientists and what they have. Um, you said a while ago about um, that they haven't. Is Jim Hansen right? I believe he is, and by the time we have to find out if we're right, it's almost like kind of time's up. So we should always be erring, I believe, on the side of it's happening because and trying to prevent it, much like we saw with COVID, it's like, take the vaccine. It's not, it's got to be better than the alternative. And look, the alternative is right here. We need... And the worst will be averted if we do this. Um, but we, so we kind of need to do the same thing for the climate. Um, the one you, you have touched a number of times on equity and I am all for this. I find the notion that we are to reduce to 43% of 2010 levels. It's like, we, we, we're over here in, you know, Zsa, Zsa land, you know, where we are burning, you know, 18, 20 tons per person. And then there are nations that are a, a tenth of that, you know. And so to ask them to do the same is 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 difficult. But you also said something that is it's you said the planet doesn't care where it comes from. Um, the planet doesn't pick sides. It just knows what's happening. And so how other than, I, I don't even know how you pull the plug on the bully nation that the US is and many other wealthy nations. How do you wrest this away from us? How do you help us realize the damage that we're causing? How do you stop this? I mean, we need radical, radical change and transformation. And, but we're living in a world that is, you know, multiple times that of other places. So how do you. Sort of like uh, my last uh, question in a way. Make, but how do you make that happen? <laughs> that's, that's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those changes are deeply cultural for each country. So what would work in the US would be different to this UK or would be different for, to Sweden. So you have to work within, at the international level, unfortunately, uh, the, the big influential states, the US, China, the EU bloc, I mean, these these are the voices that are heard. 
at the big international negotiations. And I think there is something in this that's deeply concerning is that the, uh, so it's slightly pl going beyond what, slightly what you're asking here, but the big cops, these big international negotiations, I I'm very uncertain as to whether they're worth having or not. But a lot of the poorer countries do argue they are, the, it's the only place where their voices are ever heard. But I wonder whether they're heard, but they've never been listened to. Mm. And there's a difference between being heard and listened to. Yeah. So I'm I'm not saying we shouldn't have the COP. I think they should be significantly changed. But I do think there are some really important things that need to happen to them. So this idea about power in those in those events, there should be no fossil fuel lobbyists allowed anywhere near the COPs. So literally, there should be no private sector lobbyists from the fossil fuel companies anywhere near the COPs. But that will not eliminate, of course, the petro states, the petro states where effectively they are oil state, you know, the US, Saudi Arabia, and even you know, Norway and the UK to some extent. You know, there are, so those countries will still be there having their strong petro voice heard. But I think that when you look at it at the moment, the, the oil lobbyists, they, they dwarf everyone else that's there. But they simply need to be removed out of that. How then you reduce the power of these bullying nations like the US, like, like the EU, like China, and, and we listen more, much more to the voices of the global south. I think we're only going to get that if we internally within our countries hear people in the UK and the US argue against their government's position. And that we have to stand up in our countries and make noises within our countries so our policymakers start to be concerned about us as voters. I mean, we're in democracies. However, you know, uh, uh, inefficient and inadequate our democracies may be, they're still there. And I think our voices can still often be heard collectively, at least. And I think we have to start to we, we haven't done this. We, we haven't voiced our, our views as citizens in our society is sufficient to drive the, a different agenda from our leaders. But I think there is scope for doing that in democracy. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh... I'm, I'm struggling because you're saying that we should not speak and we should not listen. And, and, and yes, I agree. But at the same time, it's like we 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 are we're the problem. We're the ones who need to yeah. change everything and and we're not doing it. And and who is who is the boss? Who's gonna come and tell us this is the way it needs to be? We we're the boss. <laughs> I, there, there is I, do not rely on do not rely on some benevolent dictator to tell us what to do. Um we have to look to ourselves and our friends and our colleagues and our working environments and our local politics and so forth. We have to drive that ourselves. And I think doing it collectively is really helpful when you get groups of you coming together, because it's it's very hard to do this when you're, you're pushing against the, the business as usual. But if you've got more people supportive of each other, it becomes a much easier thing to do. But we have to drive that. Do not rely on other people to do that for us. Um, you know, that, that, we've tried that for 30 years and those people have failed us. Okay. And, and um, that, they, they, don't, they don't cover it on television or in publications. No largely because of their own self-preservation advertisers. I don't even know if it's as much the equity as it is the, they're looking at their bottom line and who it's the car companies and the gas companies and every, and the, everything else that's funding those operations is, is my yeah. take anyway. So thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks. And we're, we're going to move to Robin. Robin, welcome to climate chat. What's your question for Kevin? You can, uh, you should be able to unmute and yeah. uh, turn on your video if you'd like at this point. So um, thank you, Dan. Uh, Kevin, that was an exhilarating uh, listen. I absolutely agree with everything you say. Um, I, am, uh, I entered the global warming debate back in 88 when I organised a conference in London um, on ozone depletion. And, and we included a section on global warming because I didn't want the CFC substitutes to add to the greenhouse effect. Um, and I, uh, Tom Wigley, who you probably know, spoke at the conference and he said then that uh, global warming is virtually certain and likely to be highly disruptive. And he predicted 1.5 of warming by 2030, which looks remarkably uh, prescient. Uh, anyway, he and I are writing an article together, which is a critique of the IPCC. Um, and... Um, what he does, instead of um, using these integrated assessment uh, models, he runs his model backwards. So what he does is he says, what is the temperature we want to get to by 2150? So 
1.5c, what is the tra temporary tra trajectory going to look like? And by what date do we have to have a balance between GHG emissions and GHG sinks? And the in order to get a 1.5 by 2150, you have to have a balance between sources and sinks by 2036. Mm. So do you have a, que you want to have a question, Robin? Yeah. So what it means is that, it, that the situation is actually far, far worse than the IPCC are acknowledging because they don't want to balance between sources and sinks until 2050. Yeah, I mean, th this is my problem with net zero. It's deeply problematic. I mean, if you just take the IPCC carbon budgets, we've got um, somewhere between you know, five and six years of current emissions for, for, for a flip of a coin chance of 1.5 and 15 years for two degrees centigrade. Um, so you know, the, the budgets themselves tell us that time frame is nothing like this sort of mythical nonsense that we hear from Jim's ski and, and the integrated assessment models. And that's because they've stuffed their models full of negative emissions. So if you yes. just take the budget, it becomes much earlier. And as as um, as Dan pointed out, that you know, people like Jim Hansen and many other people have said the budgets are much smaller anyway. So um, the, if you add any element to this after the previous discussion with the, the previous um, questioner, you know, the, any of the element fairness at an international level, we're talking really, I mean, this, this is going to sound ridiculous, but we're talking about zero fossil fuel use for the wealthy nations by 2030 to 2035 and by the rest of the world by about 2040. And that just about yeah. gives us an outside chance of somewhere around about the two degree, yeah, or a 50-50 to outside chance of two degrees centigrade. Um, it's yeah. nothing about this 2050. And remember, every year we fail, that date comes earlier. So because it's a cumulative problem, each year we fail, the date just moves closer and closer and closer. Um, and and so it's that's my point I made it just briefly earlier. It's not about what we do after 2030. It's what do we do between now, in March 2024, and 2030, you know, what what level of reductions have we achieved by 2030? Not what policies have we put in place to achieve it after 2030? We need to get off that curve now incredibly rapidly. Um, you know, just the the annual reduction rates for 50 50 chance of 1.5. Just using the IPCC budgets, we need 11 percent per annum growth global reductions from the start of this year. 11 percent globally for the two degree centigrade. It's 5 percent globally. You know, it's just we're yeah. not we, you know, we're still rising emissions, not coming down. And so yet 20, we need to be zero fossil fuels during the 2030s if we're going to have any reasonable chance of staying anywhere near the sort of Paris commitments. Um, but that, and that's, that's not, not going to happen, dialogue. is it? It's yeah. not going to happen. Well, I, I mean, think the, the, do, you, do, you, do you think that our democratic institutions are actually capable of dealing with climate change? Because I've sort of come to the conclusion that they're not. Well, well, there's interesting. They have to deal with climate change one way or another. They either <laughs> deal with it from a mitigation point of view, or they deal with it from an impacts point of view. So, and the problem is, there's a delay between those two. So, can our democratic world, can our democratic governments, deal with all of the chaos that would come with two, three, or four degrees centigrade of warming? Well, probably not. It'd probably be easier for them if it could actually deal with actually reducing emissions. It looks like it's just going to wait and wait for the wait for the shit to hit the fan, if you like. Um, but there is no way that our democratic institutions can deal with um, the, the the serious sets of impacts that are going to come with climate change. I mean, that's going to come with chaotic mess socially, ecologically, the, the military tensions, all the migratory pressures, the completely change, kind of collapse of many agricultural systems, as well as all the ecosystems and the, uh, the pollination of our crops and so forth. All of those things that are going to go as the temperatures get higher and higher and higher. You know, our democracies are too fragile to deal with that. They've struggled to deal with some of the things we've seen. You know, look at the EU, when a handful of migrants came from Syria, literally just a handful. Most of them went to Jordan and, and, and Lebanon. But a handful came into Europe and we, we collapsed Schengen Agreement in the EU almost overnight. We put up razor wire between some of the countries in the EU. And, um, you know, even one of the most sophisticated political um, organizations in the world collapsed almost overnight over a little bit of migratory pressure. <laughs> and we're not talking about a little bit of migratory pressure with climate change. We're talking about every single facet of modern society being stressed. So democracy has a choice between sp stopping that happening or waiting for it to happen and then collapse. I, I meant so we're I, not I, able to deal with it in a preventative way, is what I meant. Thank, thanks, yeah, Ron. I think, well, you, you, may, you may well be right on that. And, and the, the evidence uh, is, um, Gramsci had this quote, which I've used quite a lot recently. It's, Pessimism of the intellect 
every single every single bit of analysis tells us we should be pessimistic. It's optimism of the will, and the and there's something in there about if we recognise what you're saying there, then we have to try and change that. We will probably fail changing, trying to, but at least we are. We're, the optimism exists in that. Let's try to drive that change. Maybe maybe something will happen that we we cannot possibly envisage occurring. I don't know. Maybe it can. Um, but I think to give to, to give up is is too dangerous. I think we have to push our system as hard as we can possibly push it, and we will likely fail in trying that. But we're guaranteed to fail if we don't try. So, you know, intellectually, yes, I think you're right, but but I don't know a hundred percent that you're right. Thank, thanks, Robin. And now we're going to move to Eric. Eric, what's your your brief question for Kevin? Um, I like this pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will concept. Um, seems like a really um, uh, that's a that's a nice. Um, I think sometimes I'm using the term net zero when probably I should use a different phrase. I might have to ask the question twice, but it's very brief. Um, <laughs> So what I'm what I'm trying to say is I'm talking to someone who doesn't really understand much about climate. And I'm saying, yes, there probably are a few industrial processes that we'll never figure out, or for years, we won't figure out how to get them to zero. And for those, we're going to definitely need carbon capture. So there's that sense of you know, net zero, meaning when we've really shut down general use of fossil fuels, there may be a few processes that you still need to do. And I want to use a different term than net zero if this net zero has a has that problem associated with it. Is my question clear? What's yeah, I mean, phrase? okay. Yeah, what term do we use? I mean, to me, I, I like to think of it just in, in, I like to break the bricks down. Actually, we, we should be using no fossil fuels for energy. There's no reason we have to be using fossil fuels for energy. We can move away for processes like cement production. Now, there are lots of things we can do to reduce emissions from cement. But at the moment, we don't know how to eliminate them. And it's about 8% um, in total from cement. But I mean, probably about 4% of emissions come from the what are called industrial emissions in cement production. And we may have to capture those. Now, that, that we can capture those. That's fine. We can find ways to do that, to capture those. At steel, there's probably a lot we can do to move away from emissions in steel. There are lots of other things. You can use hydrogen to some extent as a reducing agent. So there are lots of technical things on steel you can do. And what we can't do, we can probably gain capture it. There are problems to me in one sector that we, we haven't touched on here is agriculture. As far as I'm aware, um, we cannot eliminate all emissions of greenhouse gases from agriculture. You know, even if you all went, if the whole world went vegan and we had no till plowing then or no 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 till farming, we'd still have emissions of of um, N2O from fertilizer use and from methane as well. And so we cannot eliminate all of those. And they're very significant at the moment. We can reduce them from dietary practices and from agricultural practices. But that's an area where we will have to deal with the ongoing warming from that. So I think that that's an area where I think there's a net bit to be played out. But that's not what we do. In our scenarios, we use the net bit to allow us to continue to burn fossil fuels, typically aviation and shipping, but other sectors as well, and to delay action in the near term. So I'd rather see it broken down. So no fossil fuels for energy use at all. Capture it from the industrial processes that you cannot eliminate all the fossil fuels from. Capture it from those and then deal with agriculture separately from that. Um, in terms of you know what are the things we have to do to deal with agricultural emissions, as soon as you put them all into one big spreadsheet, they're manipulated by governments, by by bean counters to mean we haven't got to put the policies in place that are necessary. So break them down separately and treat them separately. But I guess it's just just a different term I should be using when I'm trying to explain to someone in the future that we will be using zero greenhouse gas um, for for energy. There may be some industrial processes, and we're going to need to offset those. Maybe that's it. Maybe I should just say, you know, that, offsetting I mean, I, I the think remaining. That's, yeah, yeah, I don't know the word offset, but yeah, we have, we have to. Yeah, we'll. But that's a, in that case, that would work fine. So say it as it is. Simple. Use simple language like you've used there. I mean, no one knows what net means anyway. When you say ASPI, or they get different views of what we mean by so, net anyway. Okay, great. I think that's so the answer I wanted. Offset the remaining. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And Geosphere, uh, welcome to the stage. What's your uh, question to for for Kevin? Oh, well, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Kevin, very much. It's really insightful. I just want to know, I mean, it seems as if as if our civilization is absolutely dependent on a massive amount of energy. And at the moment, of course, globally, it's like 80% fossil fuels. By saying no fossil fuels, do you mean there should be a massive reduction amongst us as civilization generally in our use of fossil fuels and our 
use of stuff generally? Um, or do you think that we can transition to some kind of renewable energy like solar and wind um, and do that without adding a massive amount of carbon in the production and the processes? Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's not really possible. Like in Africa, it's really difficult, the distribution. And then just one last question. What's your thoughts on new generation nuclear um, and like uh, thorium derived? Thank you very much. OK, well, there's a lot in there. Um, well, the first thing we say, we, we talk about our civilization, but remember that most, most energy use in the world is not by the majority. Even in rich countries like the US or the UK, you know, the, 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 a large proportion of our populations will be the relatively low emitters. So it's a, quite a small group of us who are using these extremely high levels of energy. We are the ones that are driving the energy use um, in our societies. So it's, so it's not as if it's in any way evenly spread. It's massively um, asymmetrical, so imbalanced between the wealthy and the poorer parts of the world and indeed within our own countries. And I think that's really important to remember. And so that means if you actually start to think, well, how much energy do we need to live a good life? Then, so if you look, think of a typical British citizen or American citizen or European citizen or whatever it happens to be, how much energy do we require? So you look at our arguments of sufficiency. And I think there you can actually get away with much less energy use than we actually have today. But as you rightly pointed out, the process of moving away from fossil fuels itself will require lots of material consumption, you know, to build the renewables, to build the public transport systems, to make sure our houses are more efficient. All of that is a huge material and labor use and energy use. And that's one of the reasons why we, we must have a significant drop on average personal energy use energy use in our institutions and so forth to allow industry energy use to rise. So in the short to medium term, you will have a rise in industrial energy use and, and industrial material use, but that has to be compensated by reductions in our, in, if you like, our personal energy use. But because that personal energy use is highly skewed to relatively few people, that doesn't mean that the majority will see a reduction in their energy use. It means that those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of emissions, we will have to do that. And just to put some numbers on that, at a global level, we know that about um, half of global emissions come from 10% of the world's population. But we also know the top 1% of emitters have carbon footprints that are the equivalent to about twice the level of the bottom half of the world's population. Just think of that number. That 1% of the world's population have carbon footprints that are twice as big as the bottom half added together. It's just that the skew of energy use and emissions is just completely bonkers and obscene, and we could totally normalize it. And so once you actually realize that, it gives us much more scope for saying we can move the energy from personal energy use for that small group, you know, a vociferous, powerful, influential group, nonetheless, we can move it from them to actually address the sort of physical infrastructure changes that are necessary if we're to become a decarbonized, sustainable society. So the, 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 that's why I come back to this point, equity and fairness are absolutely key in the maths of this to allow us to respond to these challenges. We cannot see the shift away from fossil fuels just to be on top of the already bur huge burdens we put on our planet anyway. It has to be you know, done within our current, if you like, more already um, our excessive burden we're putting on the planet anyway. To, but we cannot exceed that, if that makes some sort of sense, I hope. Great, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, so I wanna end with something, uh, it's actually, a quote from you from our last interview, but maybe I'll just ask you the question. What do you think about the prospects of non-radical futures? I don't know if you remember this, what you talked no, about. No, no, no. I, I could read it if you'd like, but you, you talked uh, about the, well, I'll, I'll. Yeah, read out, yeah. I'll, this, is, this is you from our last interview. I, maybe just comment on it and what do you think now? I think of all climate change, I think all of climate change pushes our imagination to the extreme. So the one thing I will say is that there are no non-radical futures. The future is radically different from the present, either because we make huge, rapid shifts in reducing our emissions with profound shifts in our society, or we hang on to the status quo for a few more years while we lock in huge shifts from the impacts of climate change. So the future is radically different. There's no neat way around that. So you said three years ago in, in our last interview, what, any thoughts on yeah. that? 
it's just the same. That hasn't changed. I mean, you, know, you could argue that every year we fail because it's a cumulative problem. The level of radicalness, if such a thing exists, um, <laughs> increases. Um, but I still don't think we're yet prepared to open that debate. And that's why I come back to the point about the, the person who asked earlier about what we can do in civil society. Civil society has to open that debate because the experts won't open it. The policymakers won't, won't open it. The journalists won't open it. The senior editors won't open it. So we are reliant on what people like to say, what we often refer to pejoratively as ordinary people. They mm. are going to have to open up this debate because the expert community, the people that, are, that we like to think lead our societies, we have failed and we, and we are the ones that have chosen to fail. And we will not succeed unless we're pushed. And so there is this deep partnership. And it's the benefits of democracy is, is that we are supposed to respond to our citizens. So see ourselves as citizens, not as consumers. You know, we're citizens that consume. We're not consumers that are occasionally citizens. We are citizens. And let's, let's use our citizenry powers, often collectively, to drive change or to try to drive change in our society. And so I come back. I think that quote holds just as valid today, if not more so than it did then. There are no non-radical futures. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I think that's a great way to end. And I, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for your time again. Um, it's my pleasure. It, it's uh, always eye-opening, kind of mind-blowing at the same time. I'm sure that the folks hearing you for the first time will understand why I was so uh, impressed and scared, I guess, when I first listened to you uh, Boy, 14 years ago, I think it was. Uh, so thank you again. I, I do want to say, by the way, since this is YouTube, uh, if you are uh, watching the channel for the first time, please subscribe and hit like so other people will see this. Uh, we have uh, next uh, Sunday, uh, which is our normal time, Sunday at 10 a.m. This was a special day. Uh, we have Doug McMartin, a, a Cornell researcher on SRM. And then the following uh, Sunday, we have Peter Fikowski, who... We're going to talk about climate restoration, so a far more optimistic view of not only how to stop emissions, but how to get us back down to 280 parts per million or 350 or something like that. So there we have some interesting discussions coming up. This was fascinating. I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, making and making time for us in the evening for you. Really appreciate it. So, Kevin, thank you so much. Look forward to talking to you again in, in a, a while from now and maybe with the uh, some more optimistic views of, uh, of society shifting and, and following the advice you gave us today. So thank you. Thanks again. so much.